Greetings all, this is Hear Her Sports, the podcast about female athletes and women in sports. It is great to have you here. I'm your host, Elizabeth Emery. This week, our guest is Olympic swimmer Leah Neal. She recently graduated from Stanford University, where, as team captain, she led the team to an NCAA swimming championship. She's now a pro, preparing for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and competing in the new International Swimming League as a captain of the New York Breakers. She won bronze and silver medals in the 4x100 freestyle relays at the 2012 and 2016 Olympic Games. She was the first woman of black descent to swim an Olympic final for the U.S. and won a gold medal at the Junior World Championships. I am so glad to have Leah on the podcast to find out more about the International Swimming League, launched to develop commercially successful team-based competitions, meaning money to the swimmers, and as we hear from Leah, meaning more opportunities to race. Of course, we also talk about Leah's training and hear her stories about swimming as a kid in Brooklyn, what it's like to have been at the Olympics, giving back, and finding a bit of balance as a new pro. Welcome, Leah. It's really great to have you here. Yeah. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Let's start with the International Swimming League. This is the first season for the league. Could you introduce what it is and how it works? Because I'm sure that not everyone is familiar with it. Yeah. So like you said, it's the first year of the International Swim League. So like it's been a great opportunity for me to be part of kind of the guinea pig generation of it in its first year. It's just about making swimming more of a professional sport because like Once you've already like exhausted your amateur eligibility in college by either doing the full four years or or just like turning professional within the four years, that transition from amateur to professional just purely meant that you could now start winning money. But with ISL, they're trying to make the professional swim league actually on par with like other sports in their professional leagues like the NBA or NHL, NFL. So like sports like that and sports that people actually want to watch throughout the year just because swimming only garners like a lot of its attention every four years during the Olympics. But if swimming is actually attracting 20% of the eyes that are watching the Olympics, like during the Olympics, then it must mean that people actually do like watching swimming. But it's just the way that swimming is marketed or just like the very old fashioned way of how swimming has always operated that people only pay attention to it during the Olympics, because that's the only time that they know how to. So with International Swim League, they're just making it more spectator friendly it's uh like each meet is just two days long and each day is just two hours so it's really fast paced and with this in particular the man behind the entire idea Constantine he's like all about like incorporating like augmented reality and in the viewers experience with it so I haven't seen it online but I've heard from my friends that it's really cool and kind of like looks like a video game It sort of reminds me of Ninja Warrior in a way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Kind of like with a lot of like graphics like popping out at you. Yeah. Yeah, but basically it's just the International Swim League is just making professional swimming purely about racing and about making it a spectators event and kind of channels college dual meet swimming uh, where you're operating more as a team because swimming can be so individual so you're like swimming for your team you're trying to rack up as many points as possible and trying to do as well throughout the rounds as possible and then hopefully make it to the finals which are in vegas in a month yeah yeah yeah. is it fun to race in this format i mean is it fun to be sort of part of that video game type situation yeah i love it was like one of the most fun meets i'd ever been to if not like maybe the most fun And a lot of swimmers have shared that same sentiment as well, along with coaches who've been around and like been on Olympic teams numerous times before. They said that this meet has been the most fun for them. And I think it's because like it's short. It's like one session. Like you have to like go all out as fast as you can. Like the one time that you swim because you don't get a second chance like you would normally when you have preliminaries and final sessions. So It just is purely about racing and getting your hand to the wall first. And then obviously the way that they set it up 
like it's usually like a very dark arena like with a lot of like black curtains and then they have like a huge stage design with like lights it's just very cool kind of like a like a concert or like a nba game oh cool cool Mm -hmm. i love that I've, i've watched some of the videos and the pool looks really short so what's that like? Mm-hmm. Is that a normal pool to swim in? Yeah, it's kind of like the happy medium between short course yards and long course meters. So short course yards, Americans are the only people that swim <laughs> that length, which is 25 yards. And then 50 meters, which is like the Olympic pool length. Like that's what the rest of the world along with America swims. But this one, the ISL is set up in 25 meters so that's short course meters which americans hardly ever swim unless like the few americans that go to the world cups every year will race in that format but beyond that like a lot of us don't swim it that way but like other countries like if they were to swim short course they would swim short course meters Mm. it's also just like more exciting because there are more turns i guess right (laughs) like more flip turns and stuff for like the spectators to watch And that's also conducive to purely racing because the majority of swimmers don't normally race short course meters, so they don't have their best times on hand that they can compare to. So it really forces you just to go as fast as you can and not really pay attention to the numbers. Oh, that's super interesting. Does it change your strategy at all, swimming in a pool that length? Yeah. uh... A little bit, like the wall is further away than um, what it would normally be in 25 yards. So I was mistiming a lot of my turns. I know a lot of the other Americans were mistiming a lot of their turns. Um, So that was just something that you would have to get used to and make adjustments from meet to meet or race to race Mm -hmm. and just like get used to racing in short course meters more. Right. How how do you time your turns? Um, It's just like... You kind of get into a rhythm, like, no one's really counting their strokes, like, while racing. Maybe that's something you work on in practice. But you have, like, a feel of, like, how many strokes you need to take until you hit a wall. It's kind of just, like, a rhythm that you get into. Mm. So then, like, when you've been used to training 25 yards or 50 meters, like, you know about, like, how far the wall is. But when you get to a short course meters, 25 meters, you're thinking... (laughs) You're thinking like that you're about to turn like sooner than you actually should be. Right. So like people are just like gliding into the walls more or like not getting as good of a push off because they started their flip like too early. So it's just uh, things like that. But there's a, there's a T at the bottom of the pool, which tells you like about how far the wall is that you can always refer to. But some of the pools aren't configured for short course meters ever. So the T's are a little off. Right. Right. So you mentioned the team aspect of the racing. Have you enjoyed that part? Because it is much more like college. Yeah, I think like my favorite thing about swimming in college was my team and just like the team aspect and swimming for a team. And I think that's also why it just thrives so much better on relays because there's so much more like motivation for me to do it for my team rather than to do it for myself. Like, Mm -hmm doing individual events so yeah being on a team in this format especially because it's not just limited to your country like being teammates with people within your country but it's open to like everyone all across the world so like on the breakers we had people from Germany Denmark Australia Colombia like just so many people coming together and like a lot of us didn't know each other before becoming teammates on the New York Breakers. So it was really cool getting to know each other. And I feel like, like, I don't, I don't even think I'm being biased when I say this. Like, I think that our team got together and got along the most well, considering a lot of us didn't know each other. But we also came out by like the end of our ISL meets the closest of anyone, I believe. When you go to a a meet, are you guys all staying in the same hotel? Like, how does that work? And are you eating at the same place? You know, how are you getting together? Yeah, we all stay in the same hotel. Like, even the different teams are all in the same hotel. Oh, wow. In Dallas, which was our first meet of the series, like, we had 
they the hotel is just bigger because everything's bigger in Texas as well. So like there were multiple like <laughs> conference rooms, like ballrooms. So like each team had its own room where we would eat. <laughs> so it really like facilitated this like team rivalry aspect. Just like by the way that things were set up, we weren't allowed to mingle right. <laughs> with the other team. Like you would really have to go out of your way <laughs> to go sit and like have a meal with a friend from like a different team Mm -hmm. and then that kind of carried over to Budapest like we flew from Dallas to Budapest we were there for a few days before the meet started and this time there was a dining hall where everyone ate together but I feel like kind of continuing that isolating like team aspect people just like ended up sitting only with with their teammates (laughs) which was funny and kind of interesting to see the psychological effects that it had right right that's fun do you have responsibilities outside of the racing you know like promoting the league or attending events and that kind of thing uh it's not too much of a commitment or like too much of a of a burden to like do anything it's like pretty organic we want ourselves as swimmers for swimming to get on the map more and be more viewed just like throughout the quad rather than just every four years so like leading up to the meets like we'll just post on instagram like on stories and on our feeds just promoting it ourselves because we want to and then like at meets they'll have like a meet and greet session before the meet starts like the day before and you just like meet fans sign autographs so yeah that's really the only obligation that we as swimmers have right Has it been a success so far, do you think, the league? Yeah, I think so. And I guess, like, the swimmers, like, we can't really tell too much of what's happening behind the scenes, but uh, the people running the show have been saying that the meets have been getting better and better and, like, have been uh, moving more seamlessly from meet to meet. So everyone's learning from their mistakes and really polishing it up to become, like, a truly, like, perfected event. And, like, we've all really enjoyed it, and everyone's already looking forward to talking about, like, the ISL series for next year. And, yeah, Constantine already told us that he's going to add two more teams to the eight teams that already exist, and then he wants, like, way more, like, more than, like, three times the number of meets that we had this year already. Yeah. Yeah, so he really wants it to be, like, a year-long thing. Like, have the season run, like, all year rather than just, like, for the two or three months that it ran for this this time around. Right. Well, his aspirations are really grand. I mean, to compare it to, you know, like, the NFL and NBA, that's, that's pretty aspirational. Yeah, and I think it's great that he sees the potential – of swimming and of swimming as like a professional sport and thinks of it so highly because unless you're thinking miles ahead it's hard to like work towards that but he's like confident that swimming can get to that level of professionalism and of like spectatorship so I think it's cool to have someone who believes in it so so much right um and to have him spearhead this uh professional swim league right now i mean the other nice thing about it is that it sounds like i mean at least from what i've read it sounds like one of the main sort of missions is to make swimming financially possible for swimmers once they get out of college and this seems like a really big deal given discussions about pay equity in soccer and basketball because he is having you know equal male and female on the team uh yeah that's that's pretty important and i think Swimming has always been, as far as I'm concerned, like pretty equal between the sexes. I mean, like the U.S. Olympic team, they're allowed 23 men and 23 women. So that's been the standard. So it's nice to see that continue on with the ISL League. And someone had asked, who's like not in the swimming world, but was asking about ISL and how it operates and they thought at first that it was a women's only league and they were saying oh that's so great that that's a thing but then like one of my friends who's also in the ISL league clarified that it's actually not like there is a team the DC Trident has a women's only staff which is pretty progressive and just like changes things up yeah 
Uh, so that's separate. But having the ISL league actually be like evenly split between men and women is actually even more progressive. Just so that it's not like a it's not like a WNBA versus an NBA. Right. right. Like the same set of eyes are watching the men as the women. So it kind of puts them both on a level playing field. Right. Right. Has being on this league impacted your training at all? Have you altered anything? Um, no, it hasn't, uh, it hasn't impacted training like too drastically, especially since it's pretty early on in the season. And like a lot of my teammates and I, we had been training for like a month at the start of the season before the first ISL meet. So it's been, it's been fine. It's just like a good opportunity to race so early on in the season and get into race mode rather than to like have the long lull of getting your aerobic base back up and then like putting in the yardage which gets really boring and everyone (laughs) knows October is the worst time of the season because all you're doing is just like a, a lot of threshold a lot of just like aerobic stuff to get back into shape so it's nice to have these meets to break it up and like get in some racing and just like get those fast twitch muscles firing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but for next year when they start adding in more meets throughout the year that may pose as a bit of a challenge for people who are used to longer training blocks I feel like that's like the only thing that would kind of raise some eyebrows right has this changed sort of your your attitude about competing? Because in the past, I know that swimmers don't compete all that often. And particularly in this fall, you've competed, I don't know, very regularly mm-hmm. in the league. So has your attitude on the start line changed at all? Have you noticed anything? Yeah, I think that the more you compete, the better you get at competing. And what I had said earlier, like there are some people who are very like diligent with their training. So they kind of freak out if they race too often because that takes away from their training and adding all those yards to the bank that they can later like draw upon. But like you see people do it like right now in the FINA World Cup series, people who go and like win consistently, like go to those meets every year and they like tend to do the entire series and that's like basically racing every other weekend for like months so they make it work somehow so I think the way that they train is just by racing a lot and like learning how to race and perfecting how to race and that's just a different way of swimming and training compared to the more traditional way which is training putting your head down and putting in the yardage and then going to race every like two months or something on average yeah i like what you said that competing more makes you better at competing i think that's really that's cool yeah and like we kind of saw it firsthand when we uh, had our isl meets our first two in dallas and budapest like those are our first meets of the season and dallas didn't go quite so well just because we're getting used to racing again and then Budapest went so much better than Dallas did and then after that we went back to training and then my team team elite went to Greensboro for a tier pro swim series which was like a traditional meet just throughout the year 50 meters and a lot of us didn't do very well again like in the beginning of the meet and they got better and better towards the end I think because we were getting used to racing long course so like I think and I've like talked about this with my teammates that it's important to race like more often and like um, I know some programs will simulate racing by suiting up once a week on Saturdays and Mm. doing some fast like I don't know fast whatever events they compete in just so they get used to putting on a suit and getting in that racing mindset right so yeah I think it is it's beneficial to to race more that'd be cool if that had some sort of impact down the line if if all swimmers are or you know like a huge group of swimmers are competing more often I think that's that that will be interesting yeah and I feel like that could very well line up with ISL and ISL just like offering more meets throughout the year, like more high level, like high entertainment, high pressure meets Mm -hmm. so that 
swimmers will learn how to handle themselves in these like high level, high pressure situations just because they've done it time and time again. So that it's not like built up to a like breaking point by the time like the Olympic trials come right. around. You know? Right, right. Interesting. So what is your training like? What's your week like? Uh, we have doubles three times a week. Who's we? Team Elite, my team okay. in San Diego. Oh, got it. Okay. We have doubles Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We have singles Tuesday, Thursday. And then there are different like weights programs or weight coaches that people work with like on our team. So just depending on what your plan is, you'll go lift like two, three times a week or do cardio. Some people go surfing, which is nice because we live in San Diego, so we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> are you a surfer? Uh, no, I've surfed three times so far, <laughs> and I've only gone up to my knees, oh. <laughs> like on the board. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. How important is the strength training as part of your training? I'm doing something different. I'm doing cross training this year just because I've tried everything with strength training just throughout my career. Like, I think it is important, if not like physically, at least mentally, just to have confidence in your training and like just switch it up from doing things always in the pool just doing some explosive stuff like outside of the pool and having those things translate to what you want to be able to do in the pool so yeah I think it's it's important just to switch it up and just like move differently like and just like have yeah different movements translate what what kind of cross training are you doing? I do boxing and hot yoga and running and jump rope. Nice. Mm -hmm. You talked about having different movements. I mean, you've been swimming for a really long time and and I think that I read that you didn't do any other sports. Yeah, I just started taking lessons when I was 6. And then just stuck with that and only that for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about swimming that, that you liked so much? It was kind of just like a, like the wheels on the track that just like kept going and never stopped. Like I started taking lessons when I was six because my classmates, friends, they were taking lessons. And my mom just was like, oh, yeah, this would be a good opportunity to, like, actually learn how to swim. Because I've, like, played around in the water before, but never properly learned technique and the strokes. So I did that for two years. I just did it up until, like, I graduated from, like, learning everything that there was to learn of how to swim and do all the strokes. And then the next step from there was just to join a swim team and start competing. And then... From there, it was just, like, about getting better and better. And then that just, like, took up all my time. There was, like, no – there was no time to do anything else. Like, I even had to, like, quit playing piano when I was, like, nine because oh, wow. I was starting to compete <laughs> when I was eight. And there was just, like, no time for me to, like, practice the piano <laughs> well enough. <laughs> right. Did you like that focus? I mean, even at that age? Yeah. I didn't know anything different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just, like – normal for me to want to like just kind of climb up the the rungs of the ladder and just get better and better and yeah it was just uh yeah it was just like natural to me to just want to perfect this one thing that I was doing mm -hmm. do you still like working on technique and things like that yeah I love like working on technique because there's always a way to get better as you get older, though, like, it becomes harder and harder to find the little things to, like, get better at because you've already thought of everything. And, like, coaches also believe that you know what's best for yourself. So it's just – it becomes harder to, like, try to find little things that you could tweak in your stroke to swim that much more efficiently compared to, like, when you were younger and, like, first starting out and being told to, like, make one – change or something would make all the difference and you would drop like three seconds <laughs> yeah it's harder and harder but like I'm still trying to like look for ways to get better yeah what are you working on right now um using my hips and like my body to swim 
with because I've only relied on my arms a lot <laughs> like for of my career and that like could carry me up until a certain point but now like I actually have to learn how to maximize using like bigger muscles like just bigger parts of my body in order to like move myself through the water you sort of mentioned this earlier about working on certain things at different times of year like you were talking about racking up the miles in October so you you have a sort of a training arc for a year yeah I think across the board all teams it's kind of like the same because traditionally the biggest meets are always in the summer so Mm -hmm. You're just training and like pacing yourself throughout the year to really maximize your performance in the summer. So like after the big me in the summer, at the end of the summer, that's when you usually have your vacation, take your time off and away from the pool. So that's why the beginning of the season, which is the fall, is all about getting back into shape and racking up your yardage. Do you take real time off? Yeah, like at the end of the summer. I think the most time I've ever taken off was like a month and a half or something. Mm-hmm. And that was like two years ago because I was having a shoulder problem. So I just, I had to take time off. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's just like getting back into shape in the fall, um, starting to race, having a few meets in the winter, but then you take your break again, like, around the holidays but you still want to like make sure that you don't get out of shape obviously because you've already put in all the work to like get back into shape so you're kind of uh, maintaining that and then winter spring are just like a few more standard meets that run throughout the year just for some racing opportunities but those are never like shave and taper meets I guess for us like team elite our shave and taper meet would be U.S. Open, which are in a couple weeks, which is um, which is interesting to have just because we just raced. So it's like kind of close to have like all those ISL meets and then like try to work back up a little bit in our training and then drop taper for U.S. Open in early December. And then after that, we'll just have like a few more meets like sprinkled throughout the year those meets like we won't be resting for it's just like racing in season seeing where we are just seeing where our details are and then making those adjustments as we prepare for the big meet this year which are olympic trials in the olympics and that's in june the the trials start in june so you're aiming for olympics in 2020 yeah what what do you hope to compete in the 100 freestyle is always been like my best event or not always but it's like been my best event for the last few years now so I'll probably just swim the 50 free and the 100 free at Mm -hmm. trials like usually my lineup is 50 free 100 free 200 free but yeah I've like I've realized I don't have to swim the 200 free anymore so I'm (laughs) not gonna do that (laughs) right you had olympic aspirations really early on um I think I read you were nine when you said you wanted to be in the Olympics what was it like actually getting there um it was surreal like I I probably didn't think that I was going to go to the Olympics like so soon and I also didn't really like like truly believe that I could make the Olympics until like a few months before trials in 2012 but yeah, it was just, like, very surreal. Like, I didn't know what to expect. So I was just looking forward to everything, which also, like, didn't allow me to, like, live too much in the moment, which would be something that I would change if I, I could go back, just because I, I was just, like, way too excited about everything. And you know, like, <laughs> when you get excited, it's hard to focus on anything. Right. <laughs> so that's what I was like for, like, the month of trials and the olympics just like looking forward to the next thing that's cool what were your sort of biggest impressions um the coolest thing was just like being on an olympic team like just being part of team usa which was literally like the fastest team 
because because it was it was just like meant to be the fastest team obviously going to the olympics so just like being a part of the elite american swimmers in the country was cool and this was also my first national team ever so before that i was on i think six junior national team trips which are the like kids like 18 years and younger of of the u.s who would represent the country at junior pan packs and junior worlds and meets of the sort so it was cool that this was my first national team ever and i was on a team with like olympians i had watched growing up on tv and would see like from afar at swim meets but this time i was actually allowed to get to know them and become friends like i I will say like natalie cogwin was like really cool getting to know because when I first started swimming, I didn't know very much about swimming. Like neither did my mom, like no one in my family had swum before me. So I was just like figuring everything out, like as I went and didn't know any of the like real big names in swimming. I just knew like Natalie Coughlin because I would constantly see her face because she was like the face of women swimming and like Michael Phelps and Ryan Lochte were the face on the men's side. Um, So just finally getting to really like have conversations with Natalie and become friends with her was pretty cool and then we got to be on the 400 free relay together which was really cool as well so I think just like meeting everyone was the was my favorite part and like actually attaching like personalities to these faces and names that I've like seen and heard about for years was really exciting for me and then like Another thing was the Olympic Village that was just so surreal for me because it was literally the world's most athletic people all like congregated in this like little, <laughs> like little radius. Right. <laughs> so uh, that was cool. Yeah, that is cool. It sounds like you had a real sense of what a big deal it was to make to make the team, and it it didn't seem like oh yeah, of course I got the Olympics. Oh yeah, there was no. No point in time where I was like, yeah, like, of course, this is where I belong. But <laughs> if anything, it was like hard to wrap my head around. It didn't really like process for me until like maybe a month or two after the Olympics ended that I like actually competed at like the pinnacle of sports, at least like for swimming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It sounds too, I mean, I think you've mentioned maybe three times now that the team part of swimming is really important to you. Have you always known that or is it, am I reading something into it? I think I realized that like when I got to college, like when people would ask me what I liked most about like my time at Stanford, it would always be like number one was like being with my teammates and being a part of a team. And then I think like from then on, I realized that yeah, like my teammates and being surrounded by the right people was really important to me. And that like, yeah, just like being a part of a team and doing things for my team, like swimming for my team was something that meant more to me than just purely racing or like, like winning a medal or anything. Like I I would honestly say that like winning NCAAs with my team, my senior year, of college was way was way more meaningful than like either of my olympic medals wow that's something yeah this is just a quick break to say support hear her sports the best way to do that right now is to share these stories with your friends colleagues and training partners you can also subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen and sign up for the newsletter at hearhersports.com to read a couple of impressions from the interviews Plus, find out what's up next. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Hear Her Sports. Now back to the conversation with two-time Olympic medalist, Leah Neal. You know, from lessons that I've learned from doing this podcast, so many of the women I speak to feel really strong sense of the responsibility of passing along their interest in sports to other girls and women and to provide more opportunities in sports for other women. Is that important to you? And I'll add to that, you know, like, what's it like to have the added responsibility of an athlete who is a woman, an African-American woman, a Chinese-American woman? I mean, it seems like a lot to add just to an already big job. 
yeah, I do think it's so important to pass it forward and give back. Like I try to give back with every opportunity that I have. I mean, it's like hard to ever find time within the year to not be training and be able to give my time to the community and just like give back that way. But the last time that I had the time and had the opportunity was over the springtime where I had like two weeks or a week back at home here in New York. So like my brother helped me like put out a blast email or just like let people know that I was home and that like if they wanted me to come in and like work with their club teams or like organizations that like that would be something that I'd be able to do within like the two weeks or week and a half I was home for. So I had like three things lined up and that just allowed me to like speak with kids from these foundations that were already set up amazingly like to give back to them and provide them the opportunity to have swimming as an outlet alongside with school just to provide them with something to do like after school and really allow them to know that like swimming is a sport that they can like get involved with just because swimming is not as popular as like the sports that you normally see on tv like basketball football baseball things like that So yeah, not only do I go to these places and meet these kids in real life, like in the flesh, hopefully like me just like telling them my story and just shaking their hands and posing with them for photos and speaking to them, like makes them know that like I'm just like them. Like I I didn't start off like too differently from where they are, but like I feel like representation is so important and in letting them know that they too can like get to accomplish the things that I can if they wanted to just because I'm serving as like a familiar face for them and it's not something that you realize until like you actually experience it for yourself because when I was growing up I was lucky enough to have been born and raised in New York and like my club team Asphalt Green has always been pretty diverse like we had like white kids obviously but we had latina and black asian and i even had a blasian teammate which was pretty rare um and people thought that we were siblings but that was just like the kind of people (laughs) that i grew up with so it never occurred to me that swimming was like a predominantly white sport it never bothered me either but like as I grew older and started being asked in interviews about what it's like to be a black swimmer or yeah being a black swimmer in a predominantly like white sport like it really forced me to think about it (laughs) because it wasn't something I had ever felt the need to think about but I started understanding like why the question started coming up like so much more often because it is pretty rare and it is like a big deal like to other people like from the outside looking in like for me it wasn't just because I was always just focused on myself and just trying to do my best like I wasn't trying to be the first black or first black Asian person whatever like I was just trying to I was just trying to like improve myself and that in turn just allowed me to accomplish like all these cool things along the way but I understand that like it is really important for kids just to have someone that they recognize themselves in when they see on TV because that just makes it so much more believable that they can do that. So, yeah, I understand, like, the whole thing with, like, representation and that's why I try to give back as much as I can because I want these kids to know, like, just to know, like, outrightly, but to also kind of, like, ignite a fire in them to viscerally and like subconsciously believe that they can one day be standing like where I am because they've already seen that it's like been possible so like why wouldn't they be able to get to my position you know yeah so I uh, I hope that answered your question no it did that was was a really roundabout way (laughs) (laughs) it was great and I love that you just sent out an e-blast that you were going to be home I think that that's cool that's a great way to do it yeah yeah. Is this an important part of being an athlete, sort of getting out and, and having this public face and, you know, being able to, you know, talk about a message? Yeah, 
I feel like if you already have the platform, you might as well capitalize on it and like use it for good. Just because like this isn't a platform that very many people have or like it's really hard to get people to pay attention to you or want to even listen to what you have to say. But as like athletes and as like kind of like public figures, because our meets are like casted on TV, like we're in interviews and stuff. It just gives us the platform to really advocate for like what's important and just like advocating for like the future generations. And what's important here in swimming is that at the very basic level that swimming is a life-saving sport. So just showing people that swimming is cool and fun, that'll just like get people in the water and wanting to like swim and get into the sport for the fun of it. But in the process also just like covering that like that basic life-saving skill of just like being comfortable in the water right yeah have you ever had any tough moments in your swimming career i'm assuming yes oh uh, yeah for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> like the last few years <laughs> yeah the hardest part about swimming i think or sports in general I can assume is the mental aspect I always say that like the age of 17 is like the golden year because you're just like breaking into your your peak like physical strengths and you also have the mindset of like a child because you are still pretty much a child you're just a teenager and like all the like mental clutter of just like getting older hasn't set in yet (laughs) so you're just like all about like, um, I'm just going to swim as fast as possible. And that's like my only goal. And then as you get older, you start to have like more and more thoughts clutter your head and kind of like everything is a second guess. And Mm. so much of it has to do with the mental aspect because like up until like a certain age when you're young it's so easy just to like be on an upper trajectory of dropping seconds at a time. And then like you get to a point where you can't drop time like that anymore because you're already like competing at an elite level. So once you hit that level, you start like maybe plateauing and then maybe start dropping like hundredths of a second that you can celebrate about. (laughs) Right. But for the most part, it's just like very little increments if you're lucky over like long periods of time. So that can really get you mentally. So I think that's, that's a major thing that a lot of people go through. It's been known as plateauing or like burning out. Right. And I feel like burning out has had the popular like connotation of being like a physical thing, but it's actually like a mental thing. Like, yes, like burning out, it starts off as a physical thing because you're not dropping time anymore, but burning out is more so a mental thing because you're you're just like not you're not as excited about what you're doing anymore because you're not seeing the results you want. Well, the mental and the physical are so connected. Yeah, the they say that you can put in like all of the hours and energy into your training, but if you get to a meet and you're like behind the blocks and you're not mentally there, then like none of that training matters. No, oh, yeah, I believe that. So what do you do to boost your mental attitude? It's still uh, like a work in progress, I feel, but I've definitely been been not like taking myself like so seriously or taking swimming so seriously because that's what I've been doing for like the past few years, especially last year since graduating school and then moving to San Diego where I've been for like a year now just because I didn't have school for the first time in my life to supplement swimming and training. So last year it was solely about swimming. And I thought that just because I was a professional swimmer that that had to be my life. So like if I wasn't swimming in the pool, then I was training in the weight room. If I wasn't doing that, then I was like cooking and making sure that I was taking care of my nutrition. And then if it wasn't that, then it was making sure I was taking care of my recovery. So it was just a very like one dimensional way of going about life. And I quickly realized that that was not something that 
was beneficial to me or like something that was fulfilling at all to me that I needed more balance in my life in order to really enjoy swimming and like do well in it. It's a fine line, though, because, you know, on one hand, you want to focus completely on your swimming. But as you said, you don't want to get too far over in that direction. Yeah, certainly. And for me, it's been like trial and error. Like I had a whole year of purely just focusing on swimming. And then I learned that that was not what I needed if I was going to like be happy doing what I was doing. So I've also been going to therapy like since last year since uh, moving out to San Diego. Or it was like meeting with a sports psych and that's been like really helpful. And this year I just learned not to make swimming the be all end all just because like the Olympics is such a it's such a the Olympics does seem like a be all end all goal, especially when your your profession, like your career is swimming. So a lot of my mentality last year was like if I don't make the Olympic team, then this would have all been for nothing. And like I would have just like put my life on hold for no reason and have like wasted two years trading for this. But it's just like important to know that like yeah, like making the Olympics for a third time would be cool. But even if I don't make the Olympics, that doesn't erase the first two times that I've already gone. And just like knowing that life does go on after it, as long as I like prepare for that. So like right now I'm keeping myself just like balanced and having something else to look forward to, like a plan B by starting to look into business schools and study for that. And I feel like just knowing that there's something to come after this summer just, like, puts my mind at ease. Just knowing that, like, I'm not completely lost, like, after this summer. Right. And it's, like, the same either way. Like, if I make the team or if I don't make the team and I don't have anything lined up afterwards, I still won't have anything lined up afterwards. So (laughs) it's not like making the Olympics would be, like, the answer to, like, all of my my questions right you know exactly Mm -hmm. what do you do for fun now that you're trying to find balance um I what do I do for fun I realized that like I it was like easy for me to like keep to myself last year and just stay in my apartment and like not call family or friends just because it was just easier that way but this year like I keep up with family and friends more consistently. I explore San Diego more, I feel. I like going to, like, Moniker Coffee in Point Loma, this coffee shop. It's really nice there, and they make good coffee, and just, like, just getting out of the apartment more, I feel. It's just been, like, little, like, adjustments I've made since last year that's seem to have made like all the difference cool so just like little things like that yeah well thank you and i follow you now on spotify i'm very excited oh my spotify yes (laughs) that's like more that's more of a compliment to me than anyone following me on any other platform (laughs) (laughs) i'm super excited and i started listening it's really good yeah i'm I'm very grateful yeah thanks so much for being on the podcast Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Sure. Bye-bye. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye. A big thank you to Leah for being on the podcast. I've been so curious about the International Swimming League, so it was great to get the inside scoop. Pass along the link to hear her sports podcast so all your buddies can be introduced to more badass women. Call our new Hear Her Sports hotline at 725-BE-BADASS to leave your own badass comments. Our design is by Agnes Studio and music by the band Gold Mines. Till next time, bye bye. Another thing that I've been doing to keep myself busy or just like have another hobby is like dj but like the first step that i've taken has been buying the dj controllers uh set
and I haven't used it since it came in, so... Hey there, and welcome to the Joy of Paddle podcast, hosted by me, Minter Dial, a veteran of the paddle tennis world, and sponsored by Paddle 1969. Whether you're a paddle tennis aficionado, just beginning, or have never even heard of paddle, or padel, as it's called in North America, this is an exhilarating new show that delves into the captivating stories of notable paddle personalities worldwide. In its inaugural season, you'll be treated to exclusive anecdotes, valuable tips, life lessons, and humorous moments shared by esteemed professional paddle players, industry insiders, and passionate paddle enthusiasts. With each season aligning with the Pro Tour, you can anticipate two engaging episodes per month. The Joy of Paddle Podcast is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network, where you can find other great shows in a number of categories, such as sports, health and wellness, true crime, and fiction. To find out more about Evergreen Podcasts, go to www.evergreenpodcast.com. Vamos! Vamos!